Hey, this is Brock Lemires, and in this video, we're going to talk about electrical charge and electrical current. So let's begin with electrical charge, and then we'll work our way into describing what current is. So in the beginning, people have always noticed that things stick together for no reason. So this is like the sock is stuck to your shirt after it comes out of the dryer, or you have a, you know, you rub a balloon on your head and you can stick it to the wall. And this has happened throughout the history of, of time, right? So it's always been there. And people also noticed uh, being shocked. So, you know, when you walk across the carpet and you touch metal, you get zapped, right? And so people have noticed that when they touch certain things, uh, they get shocked. And people have also noticed that uh, when they touch or rub on certain materials, their hair will stand up. So people have always wondered what is going on with this. So in the 1700s, there was a scientist uh, that was named Charles Augustin de Coulomb, and he came up with an explanation for what was happening with this phenomenon. So he came up with this idea of charge, and he said that a material could contain this, this property called charge, and it would result in a contact less force. So contact less means uh, you don't have to touch it. So you're not pushing on it physically. Uh, this is kind of like gravity or magnets, but this is a new type of contactless force. And it was due to this thing called charge. And he came up with this framework where there were two types of charge. There was positive charge and there was negative charge. And opposite charges were attracted to each other. And like charges were repelled from each other. So a positive and a positive would push against each other and negative and negative would push against each other. He, he called this force an electrostatic force. <clears throat> and he actually even came up with an equation for it. And you can see the equation here. It's F is equal to a, a constant times Q1 times Q2 over R squared. And so in these properties, Q1 and Q2 represent the amount of charge on each object. And you notice that they can be variable. So the charge doesn't have to be equal amongst them. You can have one object that has a lot more charge than the other. Uh, and he came up with this char this these values, and he actually gave them a unit of Coulomb. Okay, so he names this, named it after himself, or the scientific community named it after him because of his discovery. R is then the distance between the objects. Notice that it's over R squared. And what that means is that it falls off uh, inversely proportional to a square. That means it rolls out very, very quickly. Okay, so as you move two objects apart, the electrostatic force goes away very, very rapidly. And then of course, there's a proportion factor that needs to be applied to this to make all the units kind of kind of work. And that was called Coulomb's constant, and that's Ke. And so it's 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meters over Coulomb squared. So notice now that Coulomb has a is abbreviated with a C, a capital C, and that, that stands for Coulomb. So anyway, this equation represents the force that actually exists between two charges. And so <clears throat> this was this was neat, and it kind of explained what was happening. So then when scientists started building up uh, essentially the periodic table and tried to figure out how matter worked and how everything or what everything was made of, they used this concept of charge when building building the model of an atom. Okay, so see, when you look at this image right here, you'll notice the model that they came up with. And, it, and it's a planetary model, uh, which is not surprising because at the time that was what scientists understood about the universe, you know, the planetary model. Uh, and it's essentially an atom is, is made up of three particles. So the neutrons, protons, and electrons. And the way that it works is that there's a nucleus that holds the neutrons and protons, and then the electrons orbit the nucleus. So all the things that you see rotating around the outside are the electrons and then the little glob in the middle here is the uh, it, that's the nucleus okay and when in this model these particles have charge so the protons have a positive charge that sit in the middle and the electrons at orbit have a negative charge and they actually found the value of this they came up with a value that was uh, 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulomb so very very small uh, and then the the uh, the electrons and the protons had opposite charge. So protons, it was a positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, and electrons were negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. And they also discovered that these particles had mass, okay? So they were things, right? And uh, the mass that they came up as, just as an example for the electron, was 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. So, I mean, just tiny, tiny amount of mass. Uh, note that in electricity and the model of the atom, the, the mass doesn't necessarily mean 
mean much with respect to forces. So for example, anything with mass will experience gravity. Uh, however, the force due to other things, especially like the electrostatic force, is so much more significant than the than the force due to gravity that gravity has no impact on what's happening within the atom or or within electricity. So just keep kind of keep that in mind. Uh, okay, so in a stable atom, the way that this model works is that there's an equal number of neutrons, protons, and electrons. And that's good uh, because the charges kind of cancel each other out. And so then each atom within the periodic table is classified by what they call its atomic number. And so in this example, this is this element is uh, silicon, and its number, its atomic number is 14. And what that means is that there's 14 neutrons in the nucleus, there's 14 protons in the nucleus, and then there's 14 orbiting electrons uh, in the outer outer shells. Okay, so that's what the atomic number means. Okay, and like I said, since there's an equal number of protons and electrons, stable atoms had a neutral charge. Okay, and then what happens is that as things are removed, so electrons are removed, or electrons are added, or neutrons uh, are removed and added, then th these become different types of material with different properties. Same material but a different property okay so scientists discovered that uh, an atom could actually accept additional electrons so you could have multiple electrons or, or you could have an additional electron in these these orbiting rings or these orbiting shells and so if you do that what happens is that now there's more electrons than there are protons so they don't the charge doesn't cancel out anymore and so if you add an electron to this you will have a net negative charge for this atom this atom is no longer neutral and there's some terms that we come up with so uh, first of all this now becomes what we call an ion and all that simply means is that you have an atom that has charge on it, net charge. So the protons and the neutrons don't uh, cancel out. It has a charge on it. And this is an anion because it has a negative charge. Uh, and it, it's just because you added an additional electron to that. And that's just a property of material that scientists discovered. Uh, and then additionally, you they found that you could have atoms where you could remove an electron from the outer orbital and this then resulted in a net positive charge because you had now more protons than you did electrons so this atom would essentially look like a positive charge and then this is also called an atom or excuse me an ion of course because it's an atom that's charged but this one's a cation because it is a uh, it has a positive charge okay let us take a pause here and talk about an important concept <laughs> We are going to be talking about uh, charge moving in circuits uh, as we learn about electrical engineering. The electrons are going to represent the movement of negative charge, but protons are not the movement of positive charge, okay? It is the absence of an electron that gives us our positive charge. And if you think about it, this right here, when it's when you have an absence of an electron, we call it a hole. Okay, it's a hole that can receive an electron. And this atom wants to put an electron in there. So it is trying to pull an electron into here. So it's got an equal and opposite force to an electron that which has a negative charge. And so this essentially looks like a positive equal and opposite charge. So it looks like a positive charge. That's the important concept because this these holes represent the movement of positive charge. A lot of people look at the proton and go, oh, well, we're moving the proton along because that's got positive charge. We do not do that, okay? If, to get to the proton, you have to split the atom apart, and that's a that's a bomb, right? I mean, it just blows up. And we don't do that. That is not what we do, okay? We leave the protons and neutrons always stay there, clustered together in the nucleus. And we do absolutely talk about positive charge moving through materials, but it's in the presence of holes. Okay, so that's kind of a that's kind of a big concept that you, we need to get covered right away. Okay, so then as as scientists kind of looked at you know the, all the different atoms, they kind of classified the periodic table into uh, different types of materials with respect to how easily thing you know that people or atoms could accept more electrons or give more electrons, and so they have kind of uh, this this word called metals, uh, which are substances or elements that can give or receive electrons very easily. And most of the periodic table are metals. Uh, and then there's obviously some that are not going to do that. So you have non-metals, which don't give up their electrons very easily or don't accept electrons very easily. And then of course you got some in the middle, which are just called semi-metals. Semi um, 
make sure that at this point uh, we remember that we're just talking about like the scientific explanation of the periodic table. Okay, we're not yet to the point where we think about like conductors and insulators uh, at, like electrical engineers do. Okay, we are just talking about the base elements uh, because what you'll see is that you can create compounds that'll give us uh, different properties than what we see in an individual atom. Okay, so we'll move more into that as we go through this material. Okay, now we're sitting here and we have a little bit of background on charge and how it can possibly propagate through materials. And so uh, what we really care about as electrical engineers is how much charge or how many electrons can pass through or do pass through a given point per second. And that, uh, that thing is called current, okay? And so we define this thing called electrical current as the amount of charge that passes through a point uh, uh, in the material or any point uh, per time. Okay, so we give current the letter I, and then we have it's essentially charge over time. Okay, this does have units, and the units are amperes or amps. You know, no one ever calls it amperes. Uh, it's called amps, and it's given the the you know a capital A is kind of the abbreviation of it. And this was named after a, a scientist called uh, Andre Marie Ampere. And he worked with, you know, he came up with a bunch of laws that discover that govern, you know, current and how it relates to magnetism. But for here, he got this unit named after him. So it's I is, is equal to Q, delta Q over delta T. Okay, so it's charge per time. Okay. And one amp would be defined as one coulomb of charge moving past a point in one second. Now we start thinking about uh, current and its direction, okay? So if you look at this kind of image right here and you see these electrons moving from atom to atom, and atom to atom, uh, the electrons are flowing a certain way. And in this image, it would be flowing to the right, okay? But like we discussed with holes, the holes are essentially moving to the left because each time one of these electrons, you know, jumps from one atom to the next, it leaves a hole which then wants an electron. And so you can essentially think of that as all these jumps and vacant, uh, vacant spots in each uh, orbital of the atom are kind of hopping boom, 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 boom like that. So there's this equal movement of holes holes uh, going to the left as there are electrons going to the right. And so what we do is we define current as the movement or the direction of positive charge. So we always draw an arrow when we talk about current that represents the direction the positive charge is going. And that convention just happens to come from Benjamin Franklin. That's when he was looking at this for the first time. He just came up with this idea of current is always where, which way the positive charge goes. And so there's a lot of people discuss this where they say, well, it's kind of interesting that current is defined as positive charge, uh, the direction of positive charge, because there it's the direction of like an absence of anything. And it may have been easier to define positive charge as the movement of the electron because it's actually a thing moving, uh, but it doesn't matter. That's just what it is. So <laughs> current is always flowing in the opposite way that the electrons are flowing. But as you learn, as you learn, it doesn't really matter. We use, we use current uh, for all of our calculations when designing circuits and analyzing circuits. So we, st we move rapidly away from the electron uh, anyway, okay? Okay, so let's talk about the order of magnitudes of current used in society, okay? So uh, little integrated circuits might use anywhere from 0 0.000001 amp up to 0 0.001 amp, so very tiny amounts of current. Uh, your USB drive, it's like, what can that provide? So standard USB can provide 0.5 amps, USB 1 could do that, and then modern, you know, newer versions of USB can provide like one and a half amp or even a little bit more, uh, right around that ballpark range. Uh, your outlet in your home, uh, a single outlet with nothing else plugged in in your house uh, or on that particular relay <clears throat> uh, can do 15 amps, okay? So that's the max. And so if you drew more out of that, you'd flip a relay and you'd have to go out to your breaker box and reset it. Uh, and, and this is for the 15 amp max is for all the outlets that are on that particular relay. And so if you plugged in a 10, a 10, and a 10 in your kitchen, it would flip the relay, okay? Uh, and then like your refrigerator is, is 20 amps, okay? So it's it's kind of a standard 20 amper. Uh, 
your home homes typically can get or typically receive uh, you know 100 to 150 200 amps and then when you look at like high voltage power lines or high high energy power lines you know these are like thousands of amps okay so it ranges it's a huge range of uh, units here okay let's do a classic example whenever you talk about charge and current everybody always wants to do this example and it's just kind of an interesting uh, just thought exercise so if you took a material and you just said I want to know how many electrons pass through a point per second to achieve one amp okay what does one amp look like in terms of the number of electrons that move through so what you do is you'd, you'd get your definition of current which is charge per time and you'd plug in how, what charge you want and what time you want so I want one amp is equal to one coulomb over one second that's just the definition of it and so you'd say okay uh, the second remains the same amps remains the same and I'm trying to figure out how many electrons does it take to represent uh, one one coulomb and so what you do is you say multiply the charge of an electron by the number of electrons so n would be the number of electrons and then the charge of an electron is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. in this equation i just want net the charge i don't care if, if it's positive or negative okay uh and so then you look at this equation and all you do is you solve for n so i'd bring one at one second over and i'd divide by uh the charge and what you get is n the number of electrons would be 6.24 times 10 to the 18 electrons so it's huge it's a massive massive number of electrons Electrons that are moving uh, in order to provide electricity that has a in a, the order of range or order of magnitude of like one amp. Okay, so that's why we tend to not talk about uh, how many electrons it takes to things to make things move or make things work because there's, it's just an impractical number. So we use numbers like uh, we use we use amps because it's more representative of what we care about as electrical engineers. Okay, that's it. So hopefully in this video you have a better understanding of what charge is and what electrical current is. See ya.